Okay, so class four. So in tonight's class, um, if we look at the 10 steps of the provision process, we have um, gone through steps one through uh, six so far in the first three classes. And tonight we're gonna do the rest, okay? So by the end of tonight, you should feel good about identifying perms versus temps, understanding the current provision and a basic deferred provision, um, being able to consider how to adjust a provision for uh, an exposure item, a reserve, uncertainties, what evaluation allowance is, and then tonight we're gonna package all that with how does it come together? Okay. So how do you pull those first six steps into a provision? And some of this we've actually already talked about, like item nine, uh, prepare rate reconciliation. I kind of have already had you doing that in a basic way. Um, and tonight, that rate reconciliation part is just um, repetitive. But you'll see that the um, item eight is where we'll spend the most time, which is um, getting your tax accounts right. Okay? And so when you're a company and you do a tax provision, um, you know, so far when we've been doing in-class exercises, we calculate what the current expense is and the deferred expense and the total, and we do a rate rack, and we try to explain it. Well, in the real world, when you've computed your provision, then you have to book it, right? So you have to actually book a journal entry, and then the tax accounts, meaning like your payable and your provision, they have to reflect the balance you want them to be. And that might, that might seem really obvious, you know, you compute the answer and then you need to book the answer. Like that's just basic accounting. But you'd be surprised how hard that can be for some companies. Um, so we're gonna go through like how do you do that, right? So that'll be step eight. But by the end of tonight, the whole idea is you can do a basic provision from beginning to end. All the way from starting with a set of facts to I've computed it, I can do the disclosures, I can get a um, small provision completed. Okay, so step seven, computing the total provision. So you have seen this slide before. Um, this slide simply summarizes the components of the total provision broken down into three pieces. All right, the current expense, and the current expense is just what you expect to owe on your tax return. And so for the current expense, right, if I was thinking of journal entries for my pens don't show up. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, so the current provision is simply the tax that you expect to pay on your tax return. And if we were doing journal entries for these things, the current tax expense would normally be something like um, debit uh, expense credit payable, right? So if we were thinking journal entry-wise, that might be a journal entry that we would expect to book for the current, okay? Deferred expense. So the deferred expense can go any which direction, but you're still gonna have a debit and credit. And that's what this little um, box down here at the bottom says, is depending on which direction your deferreds are moving, your expense will move in a, a specific direction too. So if, um, I think maybe the easiest one to understand is say this one. So if we're building DTLs, we're deferring taxes, right? We'll say, we don't wanna pay tax on our return now, we're gonna pay tax in the future. So we need a DTL to reflect the fact that we're gonna have tax in the future. Well, in that case, our journal entry is gonna be to credit a DTL and to debit uh, deferred expense. And so this box at the bottom is meant to just be a little cheat sheet for you to show you, depending on the direction of the deferred movement, you can now understand what the corresponding provision effect is. Right? It's better for me if you think about them in terms of journal entry steps. Right? Think, think of which way the deferred has to go and then put it in a journal entry. So if the detail needs to get bigger, that's a credit to the, to the balance sheet. Well, if you need to balance your journal entry, then the debit has obviously got to be to expense. If by contrast, let's say that you were a company that was profitable, but you were using NOLs, 
Okay. Well, there you're not paying tax, right? Because you're using your net operating losses from prior years. You're saving tax this year that you knew you were going to save and had booked a DTA for before. So you're using a DTA, so your DTAs are going down. So you need to credit DTAs, debit expense. So in both those cases, these are debits, right? That's a debit, and this is a debit. So depending on whether we're talking about deferred assets or deferred liabilities and the direction it goes, just think of how to balance a journal entry. Okay? Just practice that. And then non-current expense. So we talked about that in last class in terms of this being our FIN 48. And when we set up reserves, we're going to credit our liability. And to balance our journal entry, we're going to debit our expense. And if we end up not paying the reserve, let's say that the statute closes and we don't end up having the exposure, well, then we would book the reverse entry. Right? We would debit liability because we no longer owe it, and we would credit the expense. Okay. So important that you think about the total expense as being the sum of the pieces. Okay. <clears throat> All right, these are just words that go along with the slide we just talked about. Okay, statutory versus effective versus blended rate. The statutory rate is just the enacted rate that the next dollar of income that you have will attract in tax. So if you're a high net worth uh, in, or a high income individual taxpayer, your federal statutory rate would be 39.6, right? Because the next dollar of income you have would be subject to 39.6 of tax. Our effective rate, so by now, you better have figured out this one. Our effective rate is going to be essentially the average of our expense over our income. Right? That's going to be our ETR. So you ought to be thinking by the end of this class, you know, you ought to just think in ETR terms. Like you meet somebody who works for a company, you think, oh, do you have a high ETR? Do you have a low ETR? Why is your ETR so high? Why is it different than your competitors? Like you should always just be thinking in ETR terms. And then since you've taken this class, you understand what changes in ETR, right? Term items. So if you have an R&D credit, your ETR goes down. If you have um, non-deductible compensation, your ETR goes up. Um, around here, if you have earnings in a foreign jurisdiction that aren't subject to high taxes, your rate goes down, right? So important that you think about that it's kind of top of mind to you or you're quick to process like what the ETR effect of any given fact is that comes your way, right? So if I said to you, um, a company set up a valuation allowance and um, how does that affect their effective tax rate? So we end, if, if I was setting up a valuation allowance, how would that impact my ETR? How would it impact my ETR? Would my ETR go up or down? If I was setting up a valuation allowance, go for it. Shilpa, right? It shouldn't change. No. Priyesh, you're my valuation allowance guy. Let's say that you were at this company that you're at now. I can't, I don't know where you work, but. Let's say you, you didn't have a VA, and then all of a sudden you realized you needed one. What would that do to your effective tax rate that year when you set it up? Or? Rhymes with bup. It would go up, right? Okay, why would it go up? Okay, so what's our journal entry for booking evaluation allowance in the example I gave Priyash? What's the journal entry? So go through step one, two, three. What's the payable effect? No, we don't have any pay payable. Priyash loses money. No payable. Deferred effect. What's the deferred effect of setting up evaluation allowance? 
DTA goes up or down? Down. Okay. So we're going to credit DTA. What are we going to debit? Expense. Okay. So is our ETR going to go up or down now, Swian? So expense just went up, and PBT is not really affected by this. So my numerator got bigger, and my denominator didn't change. Up. Right? Okay. Since that was quite good fun, let's um, do that with the, some more facts. Because this is a cool skill to be able to, oh, that is not good. Let's see if it'll, oh boy. <coughs> this is going to be a rough video to watch. Okay. So. We just said that if we had a valuation allowance increase, that that would make our effective tax rate go up because we're having fun practicing our effective tax rates. So let's say that we have a um, uh, state come audit us and tell us that we owe more tax. Is that going to make our effective tax rate go up or down? Okay, why up? Because the numerator goes up and PBT doesn't change, right? Okay, so let's say that we have um, earnings outside the U.S. in a Bermuda company that's not subject to tax. If we added that fact to a profitable company, like, like take a homework um, into it. If we said, oh, now what would happen to their effective rate if they had a company, a, a new company in their group that had foreign earnings that weren't subject to tax? Would that make their effective rate go up or down? It would remain the same. I think only in your VA world would it, only in your pre-esh full VA, put your feet up on the desk world, would it stay the same? Why would it go down? Does my expense change? No. But my earnings go up. Right? So my rate goes down. So your rate can change by both numerator and denominator. Right? And it's the combination of all these effects that we really care about. So let's say that I got an R&D credit. Does my ETR go up or down? Down. down. Right, because the R&D credit is going to reduce my expense. Right, because I'm going to debit my payable. I'm going to owe less tax, and I'll credit provision. And my PBT is unchanged. So what if SWE N then comes in and audits my R&D credit and disallows it? What happens then? And it goes back up, right? So in that year, my expense will go up, and my PBT will be unchanged. Okay? So try to practice that. Practice, here's a fact. What does it do to the ETR, okay? When we go through our in-class exercise tonight, ultimately you're going to have to figure out what the effective tax rate is for the problem. But think about it as you're going through the facts. Like if I say, oh, state X, the apportionment rate went from 10% to 12%, is that going to make the effective rate go up or down? And then you would say, anyone besides Ozzy? They're definitely not cheating off you in the exam, apparently. <laughs> yeah, up, oh, he's right. 
That's not a trick question. Right? Because more of your income is subject to tax now in that state. States can be tricky because if more tax, more income is taxed in state X, well, then maybe less is taxed in state Y just because of the push and pull of apportionment. But it's not always equal. Right? It's not a zero-sum game with states. Um, okay. Well, I want you to think about as you as you hear facts, how does it how does it impact the effective tax rate? Okay. Can you just go back to one of the examples with regards to um, foreign earnings deferred? Foreign earnings deferred. So we did use the last in the U.S. taxes. We get over the state. Now suddenly we get more taxes in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. So what okay. Yusef is talking about? This is um, a tangent. I'm not being difficult, but I'm just. What's that? Well, yeah, it's cool. So hold on a second. So what Yusef is getting at is, if you're a U.S. company and you have a foreign sub, when you file your 10K, it is for that group. Okay. So let's say that we have $100 of earnings here subject to a rate of 35%, and we have $100 of earnings here subject to a rate of zero. Okay, So my effective tax rate is going to be 35 divided by 200, or 17.5%, assuming there's no states. Okay, And what Yousef is pointing out is that we're assuming that these earnings are not going to be distributed up to the U.S. Because if they are, then the U.S. will tax that dividend, and now this amount becomes 70. And 70 divided by 200 is 35 percent. You with me? Okay. So one of the things we'll cover in the very last class of the quarter is we'll cover whether companies assume that they are going to repatriate their earnings. Okay. And what you've learned, hopefully, from reading the public disclosures we've read is companies make disclosures about the extent to which they do not do this. Right? They disclose their offshore earnings. And when, they, when they're disclosing that, what they're telling you is, I'm not doing the red thing. I'm not accruing more tax. I'm doing the black thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does, I think that answers your question, right? Yeah. Okay. Blended rate. So when I say blended rate, what I mean is we're just taking the aggregate of multiple rates that apply to a dollar of income. So when companies have um, state tax returns that they have to file, oftentimes they file many returns. Um, so like Yousef works at a big company. His company files in probably lots of states. My guess is they don't compute the provisions state by state by state. They probably do a blended rate by aggregating all the states and doing like a blended state provision. That may not be the case. Some companies do it state by state, but most do it as part of a blended approach. And so when we get to our homework tonight, or not our homework, our in-class exercise, it has multiple states. And so we might practice doing state by state or a blended approach. You guys can kind of try different approaches. Okay. All right, so this problem, um, we'll just go through together. And this should be sort of a... Um, way to just check that um, you've been following the first three classes. I think you'll find that this is pretty straightforward. But we're going to take this problem and we're going to calculate the total provision, right? Because we're in step seven of our 10-step cycle. Step seven is compute the whole expense. So we're going to calculate the current, the deferred, and the non-current. Okay. The slides have the facts and they have templates for you to compute the answer. And um, and then it has the answer. So I'm going to go through it. Don't look ahead. Try to like follow and think and see how we're doing this um, so that when we do the in-class exercise, it is more productive. OK, so our facts are that we have net income of a million dollars, but that's after tax of 300. So the pre-tax income is a million three. And 
And listed below are our book tax differences. Okay, so tax depreciation excess of books, 75 grand. So that means we're taking a deduction that is bigger for tax than book of 75. Is that a uh, timing item or a perm item, Michael? Tax depreciation. Uh, it's a timing, item. timing item. Okay, meals and entertainment expenses subject to 50% disallowance of 10,000. Where's Chen? Hey, Chen. Hey, Chen. <laughs> we were just talking about how you can't sit next to Ozzy because you always sit next to Ozzy and now you sat behind Ozzy. <laughs> That's pretty pathetic. All right, Chen, what do we do with that? Is that perm or temp? Perm. Outstanding. 263A adjustment in excess of book capitalization, 50 grand. Roomy. Temporary item, right? We're going to add that back. For tax purposes, we're going to add that back now. We're going to deduct it later when we sell the inventory. Okay? Non deductible fines and penalties. That's easy. It's perm, right? It says non deductible. Section 199 deduction. Megan, is that perm or temp? That is permanent. Yes. Additional accrual of bad debt reserves of 45000 Shooty, is that perm or temp? That's temp. So why is that temp? So we'll deduct it when we write off the receivables instead of accruing a reserve, right? Okay. Bonuses accrued but not yet paid. Uh, Marina. Temp. Okay. So federal rate of 35, state rate of 7. Okay, so this should be pretty easy, right? So like, treat this as the exam, right? So the question is, could you do the provision for this? All right, so if those were the facts, the exam will look something like this. It'll say, compute the current, compute the deferred, tell me the expense, do the journal entries, what's the effective rate, right? So this will be typical, okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's try to figure it out. So net income before tax. Uh, Luis, do you have a phone with a calculator? You're going to be my calculator guy because you're closer. All right. All right. So net income before tax was what? 1.3 million. Perm items, 50% of meals entertainment. Chen, what are we doing with that? We're going to add it back. 5,000. Okay. Perm item, fines and penalties. That was 2000 That was the one I said was really easy. 199 uh, Megan, you answered that one. What should we do with that? What's the other thing besides adding it back? Subtracting it. Okay, so 199, what 199 is, is the U.S. government saying to companies, if you make stuff, if you manufacture stuff, and then you make money doing it, we like that. That's good for the economy, so we're going to give you a deduction. Okay, so it's called the domestic manufacturer's deduction because this is an incentive for domestic manufacturers. So 199 will always be a good guy. Can't have a bad guy. Yeah, that's 9% of what your qualifying income is. And so if all you did was manufacture stuff, it would be 9% of your taxable income. All right, additional de tax depreciation. So that was 75000 and we said that was a temp. We um, say that it's additional tax, so we'll just say that's a deduction. Section 263A, so Rumi, what do we do with that? We add that back or deduct it? Mm. 
It says 263 adjustment in excess of book capitalization. So I think what it's trying to say is there are costs that books hasn't capitalized yet that tax will. So that means we're going to add it back now and deduct it when we sell the inventory. Okay, bad debt accruals. Um, Shudi, are we going to uh, add that back or deduct that? Add that back. Okay, and Marina, bonuses, are we adding that back or deducting it? Adding it back. Okay, why are we adding it back? So books expense, so say you work for Yousef's company and he says, I'm going to pay you a bonus and it's 2015 and you're like, that's great news, right? Um, like, when should I expect this? And then he says, how about I pay you in like June of next year? And you're like, well, that's not as great. Sort of like it now. So the way the tax rules work is they say that if Yousef paid it within two and a half months of your end, you would deduct it on Yousef's corporate tax return for 2015. But if the payment happens after two and a half months from your end, his corporate tax return doesn't reflect the deduction until the year of the payment. Okay. So when the facts say that the bonus hasn't been paid within two and a half months, it means it's not deductible this year. It's deductible later when it's paid. Okay. So it's a deferred tax asset. Okay, we add up all those amounts, and Luis, the answer is? Uh, 1.343 million. 1343. Okay. And we're doing um, both Fed and state taxes. Is Hoy here? Megan, did you lose Hoy? Oh, way back there. All right. Why do we uh, calculate state tax first, Hoy? State tax is deductible for federal. Okay, so 7% of 1343, Luis, is? It's 7%, right? What was it, 7%? 7%. 94,010. 94,010. Okay. Uh, so that number actually goes there, and this should be 7%. Okay, so our federal taxable income after our state deduction. So if I take my 1343, and Megan, am I going to deduct the 9410 or am I going to add the 9410 back? Deduct. deduct. So 1343 minus 9410 is? 1248 990. 1248 990. My federal rate is 35%, so what's 35% of that? 437,000. Okay, so what is my total current expense, Shri? Just tell me in words, don't tell me the number. It's uh, the state plus the federal. It's the state plus the federal, right? It's the 9410 of state plus the 437 of federal. So the sum of those two is? Five thirty-seven one five seven. I did it in my head. There you go. I'm joking. Good I just have it in front of me. <laughs> okay, current expense, right? So remember, one of the problems was, and one of the questions was, what's the journal entry for this? Do you want to answer that now or later? Okay, now, Sonia, what's the journal entry for this? Is that credit or debit? Okay, credit payable and debit expense. Okay. So, see how, um, like, we flipped a number of signs, right, in doing this, whether it's the journal entry or the facts. Like, those things are going to throw you off big time when you do the problem, right? Because one little, like, misdirection and then everything else falls apart. So, make sure that when you go through it, you go through it, like, slowly, deliberately. You understand the direction. Don't just kind of quickly assume.
Okay, that's important. The purpose of the test is not to make sure you understand like how 263A works. And so if you don't know, just come ask. We'll walk you through it. I'm not going to tell you the answer to the exam, but I don't, I don't want you going down like some rat hole because you flipped the sign. Okay. All right. So the current expense is 537,157. So here it is with legible writing. All right, now that was step one. Step two, deferred taxes. So the template is so nice, it fills it in for you. So there's four types of temp items. So bad debt reserves. So Shudi, is that a DTL or a DTA? That's a DTA. So that was 50,000. Accrued bonus. Marina, is that a DTL or a DTA? DTA, and that was 30000 Depreciation. Um, Chen, do you think that that's a DTA or DTL? You think it's a DTL. All right. Two sixty three A. So Rumi, do you think that's a DTA or a DTL? DTA. And that is Oh, I think I got the numbers wrong. This is forty five thousand. And this is fifty thousand. Okay. So my cumulative difference is, so I have 75,000 of taxable temps, and I have 125,000 of deductible temps, right? So um, my tax rate blended. Well, I guess the way this problem works is it wants you to measure your deferreds at the blended rate. All right, so we've got to figure out what our blended rate is. Who wants to take a stab at our blended rate? Okay, Kai. Blended rate. How would I compute my blended rate in this example? My federal rate is 35 percent. Seven percent. What is that? 39. What? 39.55. 39.55. Okay. So my blended rate is 39.55 because the next dollar of income is subject to a tax rate of 39.55 when I blend all of my statutory rates. 39.55. If I put in 39.55 and calculate those guys, I get a DTL of 29.663 and a DTA of 49.438 and a net, a net DTL, or sorry, a net DTA of 19,775. Okay. So, Sonia, what is my journal entry for my 19,775? I do first. Remember back to this. You can flip back to it in your slides. Go back to slide five. Remember, the test is open notes, so you can cheat if you want like this. It's just going to slow you down. Nineteen seven seven five for the deferred. Am I debiting that or crediting that? 
You don't know. So if I have DTAs of this amount, and I have DTLs of that, and so this is my net DTA. A DTA is an asset, and if I'm setting up an asset, I got to debit the balance, the, the asset side of the balance sheet, right? So I am going to debit DTA and credit expense for 19775. Okay. And that's what that shows without the journal entry. Um, okay, this just does the same thing, shows the movement and the deferred. And we showed credit to expense of 19775. Okay, total expense. So we have calculated the current and the deferred. So if we were doing the sum of our current and deferred, it would be 531157 and 19775. Right? I don't know. What did I get wrong here, other than you, Seth? Aaron, what do you think I got wrong here so far? It should be a subtraction. Which, which is the it one? The tax expense. They're both tax expenses. Deferred tax expense. So you're learning the power of working in groups here, whether it's impromptu or not. Okay, so you got to be careful, right? Those little details matter. So 531 is an expense because that's credit payable. That's the tax we owe, debit expense. But the deferred, we're building a deferred asset. So the other side of the entry is a deferred benefit. It's not a deferred expense. It's a deferred benefit, the credit. So those two amounts, the 531 and the 19, they actually go different directions. So our total expense is 511.382. Okay. So if we were doing a simple rate rack, we could take our 1.3 million And our perm differences, we only had two perm differences. We had Chen's Meals Entertainment and then the 2,000 of non-deductible. So we had 7,000 of perm addbacks. So if we took 1,307. Oh, yeah, you're right, the 199. Yeah, good. Yeah, I guess it's just this 7,000 going the other way is the problem. So it's... 7,000 still, it's just going the other way because it's the 2,000 add back for non deductible expenses, 5,000 add back for Chen, and then a $14,000 deduction for the good 199 deduction. So then that would mean my book income plus perms would be 1293 times my blended rate of 39.55. That should give me the same 511.382. We did this as we went, but if we were computing journal entries, our journal entries would look like this. We already talked about it. Okay, so then if I said, what's the statutory rate? Well, statutory rate's 35 and 7, Fed and State. What's the effective rate? Our effective rate is our tax expense divided by our PBT, right? So 39.34. And our blended rate is the average of the statutory rates. And don't forget the federal effective state. Okay, so we have three different tax rates. Statutory, effective, blended. Any questions on this? Okay, I'm 
moving on to a different topic. So questions now would be good if you have questions. Okay, again, all that was really doing is just being repetitive with what we covered in the first few classes. It's the same three-step process, right? Payable, then deferred, then total expense. And it's getting to a journal entry, it's getting to a rate rack, proving the answer. Okay, sure, no questions? So I think your question is, what's the difference between the deferred tax asset and the deferred tax provision? Yeah. So the asset is a balance sheet account. The provision is an expense, P&L account. Okay. So when, when I say the word provision, what I mean is expense. I mean P&L. Okay. The movement in the balance sheet accounts will drive the P&L effect. Right? Like if you grow an asset, that'll create a provision, a P&L benefit. If you use an asset, that'll create a P&L expense. It's the same thing that's true really in any form of accounting. It's not unique to tax provision. So if you were accruing a payroll tax liability, forget it's an income tax liability. You would credit liability, debit expense. Right? Deferreds are really no different. Deferreds are just another form of asset or liability. So if you're growing an asset, right, then you have a credit side entry, which will be a provision benefit. If you are growing a liability, like a deferred liability, then that's a credit to the balance sheet, so you need a debit to expense. So now you're incurring a, a, a debit on the p &L. Okay. So when I say DTA and DTL, I mean the balance sheet. And when I say deferred provision benefit or expense, I mean the income statement. It will help you, but I don't care. Yeah. You need to know that for, you know, if you're a real company doing a provision, you need to know what your expense is between current and deferred because the first disclosure in your 10K shows the current and deferred. So you can't, as a practical reality, I mean, you, if Yusef went back to the company and he did his provision and he got the 511 or whatever was the total answer and then he pulls up his 10K, he's like, I gotta fill out this chart. He's like, oh no. I don't even know what the breakout of my current deferred is. I got to figure it out, right? So the way to know that would be to book the journal entry separately and have separately quantified it, right? And that would be a typical process. Uh, See, I just have to ask you guys three times, and then you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, Why is that? So what we're really doing is just a sort of a, um, almost like a rate rec, but in a different format, okay. right? We're really saying, we know the provision should be book income impacted by perms times the tax rate, because that's how we do in a rate rec. This just calculates it in a slightly different order than our rate rec presentation. blended rate and there's more than one state, well then you'll get the opportunity to figure that out when we do our problem. You should have sat next to Megan or Hoy and they could tell you. Okay, let's move on. Step eight. Reconcile tax accounts and record journal entries. So, I think the slides here are helpful and they're laid out in an organized way, but if you haven't worked at a company and done any real accounting, this will just seem so abstract to you, I think. Um, this is very, uh, this is important stuff in terms of, okay, I just did this calculation. Now, how do I book my, my entries? How do I record them? And then how do I prove my balances are correct? Right, because when you're a company and you finish the year and you put your financial statements together, those financial statements are really just accumulation of all these entries. But the idea is that the assets on your balance sheet are now right, right? 
So all the entries you booked throughout the year to increase your assets or decrease your assets, whatever the sum of those entries were, that left you with the right balance. Right? Like I bought three trucks and I sold one, so I have two left. There better be two trucks on your balance sheet. That's the same thing we're doing with our tax accounts. We're accruing a payable, we made some payments, we still owe a little bit of money. Our ending payable should be what we still owe. Okay. We had some deferreds at the beginning of the year, maybe they got a little bigger, so the ending deferred should equal you know, some number that we've computed as our cumulative deferreds. But ultimately, what we're trying to do when we book journal entries is get to an end place. Right? The journal entry is not the answer. The journal entry is the way to the answer. Okay? So like in my car example, right? we book a journal entry to acquire a car, debit, car, credit, cash. We do it again, debit, car, credit, cash. We do it a third time. So now our, journal our balance sheet should reflect the sum of those three entries, which is three cars. It should show up as assets on the balance sheet. And then if I sold one, I should say debit, cash, credit, car. So now my cumulative balance sheet reflects two cars in the asset section. We're going to do the same thing for tax accounts. So how does our payable accumulate? Right? If we make money, we accrue an expense, we build our payable in anticipation of having a tax return that reflects a payment due, we're debiting expense crediting liability. So we would expect our payable balance to accumulate, to grow. Right? And then we'd look at that and say, huh, we owe some money. And then you'd think to yourself, do I really owe money? And hopefully the answer is yes. And then you'd say, great, my balance sheet is correct. Right? If you do your provision and you're doing all these journal entries and you get to an ending balance and then you look and you're like, man, it says I owe like $800. But I don't owe $800. I just filed my tax return and it showed that was all paid up. Then that is a problem, right? Our balance sheet didn't reflect um, our real current expense. So I want you to think not only in sort of journal entry uh, format, like we've been doing in the classes so far, but also in where do these journal entries get me? Where am I going? Because right? once you start booking journal entries, all you're doing is affecting the cumulative balance of all the accounts we're talking about. Okay? So when, um, you know, when some of you guys who work for companies get audited, when the auditors roll into town, they don't audit the journal entries, they audit the balances. So they'll go and say, oh, your deferred tax balance is, you know, in this example. Yeah, so they'll look at like this page. Like this might be the type of work paper you'd give them and say, hey, these are my deferreds. They're, I have a net DTA of 19775. And the auditor will say, okay, well, I don't really know how, care how you got there, but is that right? Is the cumulative balance of 19775 correct? And then you'll say, sure, you know, it's the sum of these things, these, um, this word here, cumulative, is there on purpose. So those are my cumulative differences. Um, I capture those going the right direction. I tax affect them. I sum them up. That's the balance. My journal entries got me to that balance, so I feel pretty good. Right? So not only do I get to the right answer, but I can prove what the components of that answer are. That is what step eight is all about. So, um, <laughs> companies do this in all sorts of ways. Um, so, I will show you the way that I'll do it, and um, we'll, uh, I'm going to show you some like sample templates. And the Excel file that I distributed for the last class, that has in the last tab an account to roll forward. It's really basic. But um, these two things will look similar. And, um, but as we add more facts, rolling forward the tax accounts gets a little more complicated. Um, but it's really about just keeping your mind organized about what's happening. Like the individual entries that we're booking aren't that complicated. So it's, it's all about just organizing in your head, like what am I doing? Which, how do I balance an entry? How are my cumulative balances shifting? Do I get to the end place I want to be? Okay. 
But unfortunately, when you pull up, you know, three companies' provisions, they all look different in terms of how they, um, how they deal with their tax accounts. So what I would suggest is you think of a uh, worksheet that looks something like this. So it has, and this should look familiar because the last tab of the Excel file kind of looks like this. So if you were looking at the, um, that schedule or this template, you'd see that there's a column for every GL account. Okay, so these are GL accounts. And then every row would reflect an entry. So let's say that at the beginning of the year, you thought you owed $100. So you had $100 beginning payable. Well, then you made some payments. Well, maybe you paid 100 so you would debit your payable. And then we don't have a column for cash, but let's say we created one. Well, then I would credit my cash, 100 and so now I've explained how my payable balance at the beginning of the year was 100, but now at the end of the year, it's zero, right? I've taken my accounts from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and I've explained the activity, okay? That is the purpose of an account reconciliation or an account roll forward. How do I get from the beginning of the year to the end of the year? What's the activity? Maybe like after break, I'll pull up an account roll forward for one of the, the companies I work with and you can see how in reality it looks because it's kind of comical compared to this, just the level of detail. But that in principle is all we're doing. So everything we do, right, if we accrue an expense, well, forget the facts I just described. Right, like let's say um, at the beginning of the year I owed 100, I didn't pay any of it. Like, let's say I refuse to pay. I'm a libertarian, okay? And so, but then the next year happens and I need to accrue another 50, right? Because I'm going to owe 50 more in theory. So now my cumulative balance is 150. And the other side of that 50 entry that I'm accruing a payable to should be expense. So I would debit expense, credit payable. And then I would know for the year, when I looked at my financial statements for 14, I would expect to see this on the P&L, 50 of expense, because that's all the activity I booked for the year. And then I would expect to see my payable balance be 150, which is actually the accumulated amount of two years now. Okay. So when you see a company that has a good account roll forward, you can actually quickly see what's happening. You can say, oh, I see what your ending balance is. You owe a lot of tax. It looks like it's a couple years worth. And in the current year, your P&L reflects the current year build. And that makes sense. I'm good. Um, most company schedules are so confusing, you can't do that. But at least that's my experience. But if you do the account roll forward well, um, it's a really useful tool to just look at a company's provision and see if you can just explain it to somebody. In fact, the one I'll show you after break we, um, we make one of the VP taxes look at the account roll forward with us as part of like our SOX controls. And he hates it because it's really detailed. But it's such a useful tool to show him like the activity. We'll say like, hey, last quarter your balances were this. This quarter they're that. We can tell you why they're moving. And that, that why tells a good story. So if your auditor asks, like you have the talking points. And so we specifically like force feed to him like the talking points he needs to explain things to either his boss or the auditors, and we use the account roll forward as the way to do that. We'll say, hey, your payable went up, you owe more tax, that's right, because you're not making any payments, so that makes sense. And he'd be like, I got it, next, right? Like that's how the normal review session would go. It's just a little more complicated. Um, Okay, so once you do an a tax account roll forward like we just did, then you ought to be thinking to yourself, okay, I just got to the end of the year. Now, I, what do I have? My balance is at the end of the year after I've rolled them forward, right? I've taken the beginning of the year, I've booked my journal entries, I get to the end of the year balance. So now I have ending balances. And then the question is, what do you need? 
So if you said, oh, I accrued um, expense, I have 150 of payable in the liability section, then the next thing you should do as a process matter is say, do I owe 150? Because what you'd hate to do is have your provision just kind of keep accumulating expense and building a liability, and somehow you just got off track. Right? And if you're thinking, how would that ever happen? The answer is it almost always happens. Um, it just happens. Things get off track. So you should always be in the process of, uh, okay, I did my provision. Now I need to prove my balances. And if the balances don't prove out, like if you don't go and say, well, these are the actual taxes I owe, I can think of like the states, right? I do, I do my extension calcs right after I do my provision. So I should kind of know what my payable is, right? Those are closely aligned. So this proof exercise is something that you should be in the habit of doing. And the proof will look something like this, right? Like, how much do you think you owe? What payments did you make? What refunds do you expect? Like, add up all the things that are going on with your company, Fed, State, Foreign, and then come up and say, well, the sum of that compared to the balance I have on my balance sheet, there's either a difference or there's not. And if there's a big difference, you've got to figure out why. Right? OK. Uh, I'd ask you for questions, but I don't know that you have enough information to actually ask them. When we do the problem, you'll have questions on this. Let's leave it at that. Okay, rate rec. You guys feel like you got a handle on how rate recs work? Like, I think that's not too hard, and we've done enough of them now. And you'll get practice on the exercise. Okay with that? Okay. My hope is that when you're reading the homework, though, like you look at companies and you say, oh, I want to go look at the rate rack and see what's going on in the rate rack. And that is one of the more intuitive things for you. So, like, if you open up the Intuit 10K, um, like, what did you notice about their rate rack? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody? Didn't they have a big uh, valuation allowance uh, adjustment? Mm, I don't know. Do you have a printout of their 10K by chance? Remember, that was the one that was screwy. Yeah. Did you get the update? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't checking email. Yeah, I think it was um, so, uh, Intuit's rate rec, Intuit has a very stable rate. Right? Their rate is like 35%. Yeah, it was above 35%. Yeah, but it's like 36 then or something. Yeah. Right? So if you compared them to, um, who was the company that we looked at last week? Yeah. Oh, EA's was screwy though, right? Yeah, they had a lot of foreign. Yeah. So if you compared Intuit to um, like a Google, like what would you expect to see in the rate racks? You're gonna if, if you were looking at Google's rate rack and comparing it, is that what I said? Yeah. yeah. And comparing it to Intuit, you should be able to put the two rate racks next to each other and like quickly make a bunch of conclusions, like in a matter of seconds. You'd say, oh man, Google's rate's way lower, right? I don't know what their rate is, but it's way lower than Intuit's. I can tell you that much. Okay. And then your your second thought should be, why? Let me look in the table. The tables are going to list out. So the, f the first rate, federal, you think that's different between Google and Intuit? No, it's the same federal rate. State taxes, you think that's different? No. Maybe, I don't know. It's just state taxes. can't be that big. Right? Sorry. Okay, what's the next thing you're likely to see if you're just kind of going down the tables? Shannon, what are you going to see next? You don't know? Oh, that, this is actually a trick question. I was hoping you would say Mills Entertainment, and the answer is no, it's too small, they don't care. <laughs> They're gonna, you're gonna see foreign earnings, right? Intuit doesn't have much in the way of foreign earnings. And so, in that example I showed you earlier with the 17.5%, um, Intuit doesn't really have that, but Google does, right? So then, in the rate rack, for one company, you're gonna see a line item for an ETR difference related to foreign earnings, and the other company, you're not. Or at least you're going to see the lines, but you're going to see that there's a really big magnitude difference.
And then you'd say, oh, now I understand like what's driving this company's tax provision. Like, and I can explain the difference between two companies. That's what you should be able to do. Okay. All right. So there's a problem where we do a rate rack, but gosh, I feel like you got this handled, and I want to spend our time on the problem. Okay, so what we covered in this uh, um, semi-terrible lecture mode here is the total expense, right? It's the sum of the current, deferred, and non-current. Right? And every, every one of those three components, when we book an expense, it's a balanced journal entry. One side is balance sheet, one side is expense. Right? That's true for payable, true for deferred, true for non-current. One side is balance sheet, the other side is expense. Add up the expenses for the three components, boom, total provision. Okay? That was step seven. Step eight is, every time you book journal entries, you have to roll forward your accounts. Right? All those balance sheet accounts, tax payable, deferred tax assets, um, your non-current liabilities for your cumulative exposures, all those balance sheet tax accounts are rolling forward. Right? They're not just a journal entry. They're the sum of cumulative journal entries. So in step eight, you've got to roll forward those balances with the journal entry activity for the year and then prove your ending balances. Okay? And then step nine is do a rate rack. We'll get to disclosures, which is the last step later. Um, but that is step one through nine. Okay, so the problem. Okay, so the, the question that you're solving for is, I want you to calculate the year two provision. Okay? But we'll do this in pieces, okay? So, because um, I feel like we're gonna, you'll give up. So we'll do it in three pieces. One is you're gonna calculate the year one provision, okay? So we're gonna do that like it's an exam. So I'm gonna give you 15 minutes, you gotta do it fast, work in groups, but don't mess around, and then tell me the answer, okay? So you get 15 minutes to do it. The second thing we'll do after we go through that together, is we will um, talk about the true up. Because if you're looking in the facts, I give you a bunch of facts for year one on the first page of the in-class exercise. But then what I tell you is on the second page, I say, oh, we just filed our returns and stuff is different. Like what you accrued in the provision is different on the return. And that always happens. So now you should sit there and be like, oh man, now what do I do, right? Like I accrued a payable of X, but I only need Y. I, ha I thought I needed deferreds of like A, but I guess it's B. So how do I deal with that? Because if I want to roll forward balances, I can't just roll forward the wrong stuff. I gotta fix it. So we will separately, after we get done with step one, I can tell you guys already, you can move on. And move on. So. We're gonna go through how to do a true up, but I'm gonna have you do it and then we'll go through it. And then the third thing was we're going to, there's facts for a year two provision. And you'll figure out the year two provision. But the year two provision will include the impact of the true up. Okay? So you're gonna figure all that out. It's gonna be awesome. And um, okay, so your 15 minutes starts now. Okay, work quickly. Okay, so we're gonna go through the year one provision and we're just gonna do it together. Um, I'm gonna go kind of fast, right? Just keep the pace moving here. Oh, I think I actually write neater if it's flat. Let's try that. Okay. Um, let's do uh so we got federal, Michigan, we got three states, and um, payments, credits, okay. So we're gonna calculate um, 
Boy, what are we going to do first? Boy. What, what comes first? State. No, I was just messing with you. State tax. We're going to do the state tax provision. Okay, we're going to do step one. We're going to do current provision. So we have 10 million of income. We have 20,000 of non-deductible penalties. An increase in the bad, so that's perm. An increase in the bad debt reserve of 45. So that's an add back. Tax depreciation in excess of book of 300. So that's a deduction. That's temp, that's temp. Meals and entertainment of 80, so we're going to add back 40. And that's perm. And that's it. All right? Okay. I don't have the solution in front of me, so uh, tell me what that. Uh, at least you're going to be on calculator duty. 9805. That's my taxable income. So now I got to figure out what my tax rate is. How am I going to figure out my tax rate? Are we going to do a state by state or a blended? Blended. Yeah. Do you have to do blended? No. Right. You can imagine if you're doing the exam and you did three state provisions, it would just take more time, right? And so now you're probably feeling like blended seems like a good idea, right? Okay, so let's do blended. So we have three states. We have Michigan, New Jersey, and Tennessee. And let's see, Michigan's rate is 8.5%, 70% apportionment. New Jersey is 8% and 15%. And Tennessee is 7 and 20, 7 and 20%. Okay, so we know that this is going to be 1.4 if we multiply 7% times 20, and 8% times 15% should be 1.2, and 8.5 times 70 should be 5.95. So if we add up that, so that's 2, 6, 7, 6, 8, 5, 5. Okay, so our state rate is 8, 5, 5. Okay? All right, so we're going to take 855 times 9805, and that is 838.328. Okay, that's my current expense for state. Right? No. I was messing with you. Credit. So we have a Michigan credit of forty-two thousand. So eight thirty-eight minus forty-two thousand is going to be seven ninety-six three two eight, right? Okay. That's my step one current provision for state, right? So I'm going to debit expense credit payable for seven ninety-six three two eight. Okay? All right. That is step one. Step two. Deferreds. So we have bad debt reserve, which increased by 45000 So that was going up 45. And we have depreciation, which is 300000 Is that creating a DTL or a DTA, Marina? Depreciation. I would look at your work, not mine. The depreciation, is that creating a DTA or a DTL? DTL. Okay. So the net of those two things is 255,000 net DTL. And I'm going to apply my 8.55% rate. Two one eight zero two zero three. All right. Two one eight zero three. Okay. 
So that's step two, right? Debit, expense, credit, DTL. Right? Okay. So we're done with state. We got our current provision of 796 debit. And we got our deferred provision of 21803, which is another debit. So the sum of those two numbers going the same direction is our total state expense. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to try to use these same slides. It might be a little messy, but I'm just going to overlay the federal on top. Okay. Federal. So if I was calculating my federal current provision, I would have all the same facts that I show here, but I left the space for my federal deduction for state taxes. So I'm going to deduct 796.328. And so my taxable income is going to be what? Say again, you said? 9008672. Okay. So then I'm going to take 35% of that. Three one five three zero three five. Okay, and then I have a credit, right? So I have a credit for forty seven point five. Okay. So then my total expense is gonna be whatever the net of that is. Three one oh five five three one oh five five three five. Okay, 315535, that's a debit expense credit payable. Okay? So we got our step one federal provision, 315535. Now we go to step two. For bad debt reserve, we have the same 45,000, 300,000 is the same. But then remember this 21803 becomes a federal deferred or temp item anyways. So in the future, when we pay that deferred liability for state, we get a federal deduction. So when we pay the 21803, we get a deduction. So we're going to show that as a deductible temp. So now, my 255 of state temp items is going to go down to 2... Two three three one one seven one nine seven thirty five percent eight one six one nine debit expense credit DTL. Debit expense credit DTL. Okay. All right, so now let's add up our total defer, our total expenses. So on the state, we had 796.328 and 21.803. So the sum of that is what? Eight one eight one one zero one three zero. Okay, that's my state provision. My federal is three one oh five five three five. Three one oh five five three five. And the deferred is eighty one six one nine. Eighty one six one nine. Okay, the sum of that is what? Three one eight seven one five four. Okay. Yeah. Oh. 
I must have been looking at the wrong piece of paper. I think I told you you were right, but actually a bunch of other you you were right. Okay, so let um, let's uh, let's do the rate rack. Okay, Ozzy, since you're being a smart alley, you can do the rate rack. All right, so the ten. 35 is going to be 3500. Um, so we want to end with 4005284. Okay, the penalties were how much? So they were 20,000 of penalties, so that's 7,000. 7, Okay, what's next? Okay. Okay. <laughs> How much is that? Okay. So 40,000 times 35 percent, 14. Yeah, what's next? Ozzy's world right now. Remember, he's only got it right. Yeah. Eight one eight one three zero. Okay, we're done, right? Okay. Okay, is that positive or negative? Negative. Okay. Does that add up? Does this not add up? Yeah. It does add up. Alright. Yeah. Alright. Alright, so this adds up. We're all good with this? Who thinks it doesn't add up? Do I have to add this up on my phone? It adds up. Emily? Alright. Did you find your phone? No. Um, okay. So, uh, Megan, why don't we put the Michigan R&D credit in our rate rack? That is your Seth's question. Do you have a question or an answer? Oh, one at a time. Let's have Megan answer this one. Say that one more time. It's deducted before we take any tax rate. 
Let Aaron help you. He's eager. Yeah. Right. The Michigan credit is in this number. It's already in the 818. Right? Because when we calculated the state provision, remember we put the 42,000 down here at the bottom? It's already driving down the state provision. And that 796, which was added to the deferred of 21, became our total state of 818. So that 818 includes the 42. So we don't need to separately state the state credits because it's the credits are already in the state provision. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, questions on that? Okay, so I think Shilpa's question is, if I calculated a blended rate by doing, I think what your question is, is if I took book income plus perms, if I take the sum of those and times it by a blended rate, I'm not going to get the provision, right? And the answer is credit. Right. Yeah, the state, the blended rate, if you're doing a little shortcut proof like our problem in the slides showed, it's not going to work here because credits won't factor into the blended rate. Okay, that was awesome. So that was year one. Now, um, we made these payments that are shown at the bottom of the screen. Okay, anybody think about how we're going to reflect these payments and what our balances look like? Okay, so let me get you off to a, a running start here. So if I was doing the provision, then... I would create a tax account roll forward that would have payable and um, uh, let's say this is going to be my Fed payable and this is going to be my state payable and this is going to be Fed deferred and state deferred provision cash. So if I was booking these entries, I would say my current provision, my state payable was seven, uh, shoot, that's not right. My state current was, yes, 796.328. So state current is 796. 328, and my state provision would be, that's a credit, this is a debit, and my state deferred is 21803 credit, 21803 debit. Okay. So then I get to my federal, 3105, 535, three, oops, 3105, 535, and my state deferred, which was 81619. So those are my journal entries that I would book for my Fed and state current and deferred, and then I made payments. So I made payments of 3-6 for federal, and for state, I made payments of 390. 
Okay. So at the end of the year, my balances, my provision ought to be four million five two eighty four. So that's four million five two eighty four. I know I made cash payments of three nine nine zero. My furs are twenty one eight oh three and eighty one six one nine. Now I thought I owed seven ninety six and I paid in three ninety. So that makes me think I owe four oh six three two eight still. That's my ending balance. But on the federal side, I thought I owed 3105, but I paid in 36. So I'm actually overpaid 494465, if I did the math right. So in my tax account roll forward, I booked my entries. I started with zero, right? My year one provision was literally year one. Booked my entries for the current provision and the deferred provision. Then I booked my entry for the payments, and then that got me to an ending balance. So on my balance sheet, I would expect to see these balances sitting on the balance sheet, and then this balance sitting on the PL. Right? That's what I should expect to see. Okay, so we're done with year one. We're like 10% of the way there now. Okay, so now we get to the next page of the facts on the problem, and they say, you just filed your tax return, and here's what the facts are on your return. So you had 10 million of income, and that was the same 10 million of income in the provision. So you're like, oh good, no change. Um, Non-deductible penalties, I think that was the same. And then you get to other numbers and you see that they're different. Like Chen's Meals Entertainment is different. The R&D credits are different. And then worst of all, the apportionment's different. Right? Okay, so now, the next thing I need you to do is you're gonna do your true up entries. Okay? So you're done with your one, right? So say you're a calendar your company. In January, you do your provision. That's year one. So all the things we just did, you did that in January. So then you file your tax return like six months later, let's say. So it's uh, July. I know it's due in September. Say you file your tax return in July. So six months go by. You file your returns. The returns reflect the facts on this page. So now, you're sitting there with those balances from year one and your provision. Now you got to fix them. You haven't started doing your year two provision yet. The only thing you're gonna do is fix year one, okay? So I need you to come up with what are my true up journal entries to fix year one, right? You think step one, two, three, right? I gotta fix my payable, I gotta fix my deferred, and an expense adjustment might come out. I gotta fix state because if once I have a state effect, there might be a federal effect of my state true up. So it's almost like you're doing this all over again with new numbers. And then you're comparing and saying, how's it different? Yeah. Okay, so Yousef has a really good question. So for those of you who are working on the problem already, stop. So this is, listen to this question. So Yousef's question was, is it just easier to do everything we just did, to do it over again? and compare the balances on this little roll forward to whatever the new balances are. And then that difference is going to be your true up. Right? Okay. Well, that works. Free, do you think that'll work? Yes. Aaron, do you think that'll work? Mm. <laughs> 
Marissa, you think that'll work? Say it one more time. Kyle, do you think it'll work? Yeah? Wow. I said, will you vote for Donald Trump? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, that will work, is the answer. Okay, now, how many companies do that? No company does that. Say it louder, Shree. I think you guys are saying two different things, though. What Shree's saying is you can't fix your one in your one. You're already done, right? And you said, like, yeah, I agree with that. Um, what you said is saying is mechanically, wouldn't the most efficient way to come up with your true up be just to redo your provision? So I wish we had guest speakers because when you could ask them, like when you ask them, when we see the Facebook guys next week, say when you do your true up, if you just filed their account of your company, so they just filed their return, ask them how they did their true up and whether they just went and redid their provision. And their response, I'm quite confident, will be, ha ha ha. <laughs> and no, we did not. So, and the reason is, is that they're proving the balances. Uh, more so than redoing the mechanics of the entire provision. Um, could you redo the whole provision, like run it all through their provision processes? Sure. But what they're doing in reality is they're saying, well, look, my payable was 494, but then there's a balance that it should have been. And I know that from the tax return. I already have the return. It shows what the tax is. I can just look. Right? And then I can go and recompute my deferred based upon the assumptions that underline my, my return, and I can update my return number. So I don't need to go through the entire provision process. I just need to go figure out what those ending balances need to be and then adjust for them. That's typically how it will work. Did I ask your question? Yeah, I guess maybe I was interpreting your question wrong then, because I was thinking, like imagine the Excel template I handed out to you guys in class, and then imagine like Facebook, they have an Excel template, right? Bigger, complicated, lots of tabs, it's really hard. And then I was thinking you were saying, oh, we'll just take that Excel workbook again and then redo it with all the tax return numbers. And then that's the part that would elicit that. Yeah. yeah. What you're getting at is, no, you already took the provision and turned it into a real thing in the return, so now use that as your tool. So that's how people do it. Okay. So with that, I want you to take this account roll forward that we did with this incredibly sloppy handwriting and adjust it. Adjust it for what the true up is. So you're in July of year two. You just filed your return. It's different than the provision. So now tell me what the tell me what the journal entries are to fix your balances. Because we need to roll forward balances, but we need them to be correct. Okay. Off you go. Okay. So we finished year one. We have the balances that we color shaded, and now we realize we filed a return, and the return's different. What do we do next? Okay, so he went through all that, right? That's the uh, yada, yada, yada part, right? That's fine. So then you came up with new balances, right? So if we were going to book a journal entry for the changes, let me just say it like this. So we're going to have a return to provision journal entry.
And that journal entry is going to balance. And that journal entry is also going to give us new balances that are now correct. Right? Like those are the two features of this return to provision journal entry that are important. The journal entry's got a balance, like every journal entry. And it's got to result in us having the right ending cumulative balances that we want. Okay, so we're rolling forward year one balances and we're getting to what I'll call an adjusted year one. Okay? So what is that uh, true up entry? And I'm just going to do it as one big entry. We could break this down into current, deferred, and fed and state, but I'm going to do it as one entry. All right, does anyone know what the one entry is? Go for it. Wait, you got to turn the volume up like four notches. Turn up your volume. Talk louder. Yeah, we owe more federal taxes than our original provision. Six four eight. Okay. Don't you got? Different what you got though. No, you're good. Oh, okay. Okay. So does that journal entry balance? You know, I was making a comment to Kate a few minutes ago before we started. None of you use the Excel template, or you guys do, I guess, but hardly any of you do. Yeah, funny. I don't care, by the way. I'm just interested in. Okay. Say that again. Okay. All right. So if I say that those are the correct adjusting uh, entry amounts, then I'm going to get to a new ending balance, right? So that new ending balance, you said you don't have the numbers. You're close. I can hear you well. Do you know what the ending balances are? Who knows what the ending? Do you know what the ending balances are? Tell me your name. Raina. Okay, sorry, I can't remember your name. Raina, tell me what the ending balance of the receivable or the payable is. Four twenty six three eight. Okay, so now we have my corrected ending balances, right? And this is sort of a, if I could go back to year one and fix my balance sheet, this is what I would do. I'd fix my payable and I'd make them these balances. I'd fix my deferreds and I'd make them the new balances, right? That's what I would do. I can't, so now I'm just going to do it in year two. 
right? I'm going to say I'm going to fix year one in year two. So part of my year two provision is going to be fixing the first year. So I get the, I roll forward these balances, and now what does this balance here represent? Remember I said, like, as I roll forward the balances, I should try to prove them so that I don't just keep rolling forward junk. So I should stop and I say, Do, did I get the right number? So what is the 420? Like, should that tie to something? Well, so you're saying that'll tie to the balance sheet account only because you just made it the balance sheet account, right? But what else should that tie to where you'd be like, oh yeah, I definitely got the right number? The federal tax paid, close. Let's say you didn't make any more federal payments after you're in with your extension, and then you filed your tax return. The overpayment on that tax return should be 42638. So if you pick up page one of your tax return, Right? And you look at the bottom, and you see, am I overpaid? Hopefully I am. And if I apply that payment to next year, I'm carrying forward a debit balance to next year. If I ask for a refund, I should book this as a receivable. But if I look at my tax return and I see that I'm overpaid by 420, then I say, oh, perfect. I adjusted my balance, I rolled it forward, and now I have a number that I know is right, because that number actually is the number on my return. Boom, I'm good. Does that make sense to you? No. Okay, for some of you students, this is hard, because you have to do tax returns to appreciate this. But on the corporate tax return, our tax liability, you know, we made payments of 3.6 million. We didn't owe 3.6 million. We owed closer to like 3.18 million. So we overpaid. So then on the tax return that we filed in July, in my example, we're overpaid by 420. So we have two choices on the return. We could either tell the IRS to keep the money and just apply it to next year's taxes, or we could tell them to give us our money back, right? Either way, in our balance sheet, we should have an asset that reflects the fact that we're either getting a refund or we have money on account with the IRS. And so when we look at the tax return and we see there's an overpayment, and then we look at our balance sheet and we see that there's a debit, we should think, perfect, right? Those two things should go together. Did that help? When you do the tax return, have you calculated this already? And by this, you mean the roll forward of your accounts? No, usually you do the return and then you adjust your accounts next. You can do it in any order, but that's normally how it would work. So like here, you say that at the end of last year, at the end of year one, you showed a debit on your balance sheet of 494. You said, I think I'm overpaid by 494 grand. So I showed a debit. And that debit stood for the refund you would get in the future or the offset to your future tax liabilities, one or the other. Now you're saying, oh, it's only 420. So either the IRS owes me 420 or I've essentially made a deposit of 420. The key is that you look at your tax return and you think, oh, that balance that I booked, it's right because it ties to the return. Like I can prove that balance to something. <laughs> So by contrast, the state column, so I took the balance of 406 I had at the end of year one, I adjusted it, now it's 294. What does the 294 represent? What should that tie to? State, I'm gonna go with that's not enough. State what? Megan, what do you think that relates to? 
date tax payable? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. But like in a real return world, what do you think that that 294 should be? Hold on, let me try it. It's probably the checks you cut. Right? Because we haven't factored in payments yet. Payments after year end, but that relate to year one. So like for federal, we were overpaid. We didn't need to make any more payments, right? We just filed our return, we're overpaid, we're good. For states, at the end of the year one, we said that we, we owe 406. So we probably made some extension payments, right? Like that would be the rational thing to do. But we don't have that in our facts yet, or I'm not sure we covered payment in our facts. Yeah, we did. So. The rational thing to do would have been to pay 406. Or, let's say you didn't and you just said, well, I'll just pay whenever I file my returns. You should pay 294, right? Because 294 is the amount of tax that you owe above and beyond what you already paid. So you wouldn't expect to carry a 294 balance forward forever, because that sort of means you're just not paying your tax, right? Companies pay their tax, they just don't often pay it in the same year that it relates to, right? Because you're making extension payments and estimates and when you file a return, you kind of know what the real amount is and everything sort of happens on this first estimate and then true up basis. But in this example, you would expect that 294 would be the cash you would pay to settle up your state taxes for year one. Does that make sense? And now on your state returns, you wouldn't have any overpayment applied or you wouldn't have any refunds received. This is sort of the opposite fact pattern. But again, that balance that we're rolling forward, it ties to something. And in this case, we shouldn't stop. We should say, oh, I'll bet there's a payment, right? So there's probably a payment in here that happened during year two but relates to year one. And let's just say it's for 294680. So we debit the payable and we credit cash. Okay. So that would be a typical part of rolling forward the balances, right? We accrued what we thought we owed, we trued it up to what we really did owe, and then we reflected the fact that we made payments against what we did owe. Right? Like that's just sort of logical, you know, sequential thinking. And then we get to an ending state balance of zero. We don't know anything. So now we get to move on to year two. Oh, sorry. So I was going to ask, when, so when you have these true ups, right? You have to book these entries. You're already, you already closed the books and moved on to next year. And so instead of the payable, let's say you paid, you paid the payables, your prepaid, set of five, whatever, can you hit with the earnings then? Ah, OK. So Luis has a good question. So. We have been saying, well, we got to fix the payable, fix the date, fix the deferreds, but that created a provision effect. There's a 79,000 provision benefit that we got to book to balance our entry. And Luis is asking, where, how do you book that? Because you already closed the year one books, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Priyash, how do you book that? Chris was like, full VA. <laughs> Boom, no true up. What do you think? Where's Sherry? Sherry. Oh, where'd Sherry go? I thought you were in the back somewhere. Oh, maybe not. Kai, what do you think? How do you book it? This happens to every company, right? Everyone has a true up, except for pre -ash. We do have true ups. Well, then, okay, give it back to pre -ash now. Pre -ash, how do you book your true up? Okay, back to Kai. Kai, how would you book this true up? Current year what? Current year expense? 
So in year two, you're booking a $79,000 expense benefit that actually just relates to Q1. You're just booking it in Q2 because that's kind of when you figured it out. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. All right, who thinks differently than that? No, that's right. Okay. So what if that amount is really big? Like, let's say you're into it. And let's say the true up is big, like it's $70 million. Then what do you do? What do you think you do? You should disclose it. Okay. So, so far we have you should restate your year one financials, you should fire your department, and you should disclose it. Those are the three answers so far. Anyone else? Yeah, we got retained earnings. Anyone else? More than one answer can be true, too, by the way. So when we talked in the second class, I think it was, around return to provision true-ups, we talked about like errors versus changes in estimate. And we said an error means you got a prior period wrong, and you might need to restate it if it's big enough. So like if you got year one wrong and it was like a math error, right? Like let's say you flip the sign. If you thought Neil's Entertainment was a benefit, and then all you're like, oh, of course it's an ad back. Yeah, I'm so stupid. Right, let's say that effect was 70 million. Like that's not a change in estimate, that is a mistake. So if that was a big number, then you set this right, and probably Oz is right. You would restate your year one financials, and even as a public company, you would file your 10K again and say, like, hey everybody, I screwed up, here's my year one again, fixed, sorry about that, right? And then the reason Ozzy's right is that's a big deal, right? Like, that's embarrassing. And so you might fire your department, right? I mean, I say that, like, facetiously, but when there's a restatement of something that's an error like that, you know, there's usually repercussions. That's a big deal. And so the reason I ask you to ask the guest speakers about, like, tell me a time you made a mistake is because they felt Ozzy's right. So, but most return to provision adjustments get booked like Kai was saying. They get booked in year two in the P&L, just as a component of the year two provision. So when we calculate the year two provision, it's going to include the 79,000. Right? Even though it has nothing to do with year two, it just gets booked there. Okay? And so as long as your return to provision adjustments are small enough, that's just kind of normal course. Everyone has return provision adjustments. Everyone wants to treat them like Kai described. And the idea is that they're small enough and your estimation process at year end works. And so uh, you don't have a big problem to wrestle with. Right? Like that's the practical reality. How do you, small, how do you decide if it's small? There's a whole process and rule set with auditors on how they do that. Um, it, di it differs for every company in terms of what's material. So there's not like a number. Um, so if you ask like Facebook uh, next week what the material for them, you'll get a different answer than the next guest speaker uh, from Cadence. It's totally different. But like you can ask um, uh, Chris next week when he's here and say like, tell me about the return to provision. Like, did you have any big issues? Were you sweating it at all? You think you had to restate? Yeah, ask them about it. Okay, does that make sense how we do a true up? Okay, so we recompute the balances. We're trying to get the balance sheet right. So we say, gosh, we ended year one with a payable balance, a deferred balance. We've got to fix those. We can't just kind of keep, you know, maintaining these erroneous balances. We've got to fix them. So we fix them through true up entries, and then we roll forward the balances to get to the new correct number. And that new correct number, we should be able to prove. What is that thing? We should be able to approve. Uh, we should be able to prove what is our 
ending, our adjusted ending payable balance. And then same thing with deferreds, right? We could just go and do a re-inventory of our deferreds. You know, like a common return to provision difference would be, you know, oh, I didn't even realize we were going to have to add back severance accruals. I wasn't even in my provision. So my payable needs to be adjusted to reflect an add back for severance accruals. My deferreds need to be adjusted to reflect a new deferred asset for severance accruals. Like that could be a typical adjustment. So it's not just changing numbers. It could be like adding new items altogether. Okay. As you can imagine, um, you want to get your provision as close to the return as possible to minimize the you know, potential for this issue. But if you're, like, if, when you meet the Facebook guys, ask them how long they have to do their provision at year end. Like, they'll probably tell you it's got to be done within, like, 10 days. And usually when you think of the close cycle, like, books will close on day 7, let's say, and the provision's probably due day 8 or day 9 or something like that. So they have very little time to get the provision right, even though they have, like, another 8 months to do the tax return. So when you think about, is there time to create like a new line of thinking and maybe get to a different answer? Yeah, there's a long time. And then if you sat back and you're like, hey, why didn't I get that right in those like 24 hours I had to do the provision? And you're like, well, it's fine because I had 24 hours, right? But that's not really a good acceptable excuse. So companies that close fast create processes to, make, to be able to get close. And so um, if that interests you, we can talk to Chris about it. Like, how do they handle that? Because right, that's a super real-world issue. Every provision director of the type that I have come by class, like they deal with that issue. That's a very real concern. So Yusef is saying, going through the mechanics, it feels like you redid everything. And the, and the reason it feels that way is because the facts are so simple. If you filed, like, let's say, you know, you're at Intel, and I don't know how many state returns you filed, but let's say you file 130 state returns. you got a bunch of entities. They file in different states. There's just, it's everywhere, right? It's a hornet's nest. You're not going to go through and calculate, like, the blended rate over again and do all that minutia. You're going to go and look for totals, right? And so, in reality... You're not going to go through every perm, every state assumption. You're going to go and say, look, I need a payable proof. What does my payable balance need to be? I need to understand the perm items that drove the expense effect so I can com compute the expense. You come up with like practical approaches. It's not really done the way you do it here. Because like the reason I commented about the Excel is if you did year one in the Excel template, it should have taken you like 90 seconds to do the true up. Because all you got to do is run it again with the new numbers, right? And the model would do it all for you like that. Okay? But in a much bigger environment with a lot of moving parts, it's just not that simple. Okay, so now we're going to do year two. Okay, so here's our year two facts. We make a million of income. Our bad debt de decrease, uh, reserve decreases. We have... More tax depreciation, Chen's meals, Michigan credits, and then our states. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to do the year two provision and figure out the rate rec. Okay? And get the rate rec right. Don't just do the rate rec. Do it right. Okay? Work in your groups. This, the facts are here are pretty simple, right? There's not that moving parts, many moving parts. So try to work quickly, get the rate rec to work correctly. Okay, so look, take a look at the screen. And um, this is the Excel file that we um, will send you the solutions in. It's, a, it's using the template that I sent out to you. And hopefully you can see this. No? Uh, lean forward. <laughs> like, I don't know if I can make it much bigger because then um,
Okay. I know, it's still small. The point of this is, this, is, these are the journal entries for your normal year two provision. You know, the step one payable, step two deferred, step three provision. You add up the provision for those guys, 387,483. So for all of you who calculated that number, that is correct for the year two provision, excluding the year one true up, right? But remember how Kai, like an hour ago, was saying you book in year two the Q1 true up. Sorry, you book in year two the year one true up. So that means that the true up, which is the 79,618, which is the same number that we calculated here, that 79,618 has to factor in to my year two provision. So my year two provision is really 307,866. That make sense? So really, all the schedule that I have in front of you is doing is it takes my super messy handwriting from what we did manually, puts it into Excel on the top half. The top half of this schedule is the same thing I was doing with my messy handwriting. It's just when I show it to you as I write it, I think maybe it helps you think of like what I'm doing instead of just showing you numbers, right? But the top half of this is the same thing. And then the bottom half is just you booking a normal year two provision, just like it was a uh, basic provision like we've always been doing. Okay, And then we just add it all together. We just add that provision column and say that's our provision expense for year two. And then when you're doing a rate reconciliation, the rate reconciliation is going to be a little tricky because now your provision includes not only like the normal perm items, but includes a true up. So it's sort of hard to capture that true up. Um, and the reason it's hard to capture the true up is in this case, most of the true up is in the state area, right? It's because of our state apportionment changing. So the perm differences were quite small. So like you can see in this rate rec, we have an, a line item for true ups for meals and entertainment and true ups for credits, but those effects are very small. The real material effect in the true up is buried in the state provision. Okay. So you'd have to follow through the schedule to see how the, how the state provision true up was flowing through, but in that 85, that's the year two state provision, including the year one return to provision for state. So we'll send you this file, and you can understand the flow. Um, this file has a tab where it does the return to provision, where it kind of does what Yousef was talking about. It, it takes the current tab and does it all over again, right? It has a section of how it was in the provision, a section of how it was in the return, and now come the differences. But what I wanted you to mostly focus on is I don't want you to drown in detail here. I want you to focus on this account roll forward, right? Up here being we got to fix our prior year balances and fixing those caused a provision benefit of 79. And that 79 gets booked in year two with the year two provision. And the sum of all of that is 307,866. All right. Okay. It is nine thirty. Now, I want to cover just a couple other items if you can hang tight. If you want to leave, you can always leave. I don't care. But if you, um, what I want to cover is disclosures quickly, and then um, I want to talk about Intuit. I want to just make sure we cover some of these companies that I have you read ahead of time. So the more you read public disclosures, the more you'll see that there are a lot of similarities, and then there are nuanced differences. Sometimes there are substantial differences, 
But hopefully by now, we're on to the fourth public company. You see that the tables look the same, right? There's always the current expense and deferred expense table at the beginning. There's always a rate rack. There's always a schedule of the deferred. Like you should be getting in the groove of, oh, I see these things, right? And the reason is, is all that stuff is required, okay? Um, these are the rules, um, you should have seen this in the reading, but these are the rules that require the different disclosures. And the one I want to focus on is this one. Because none of you have really asked me this question yet, which is surprising. I always get to ask. So if you have lots of different kinds of deferreds, the question is, do you book them as uh, all one type? You book them as current deferred, non-current deferred. How does it work? Okay. And the rule is actually changing on this right now. So the FASB just came out with a proposal uh, to simplify this. And that proposal is going to become effective in the future. It's not effective currently. But the FASB just approved it um, last week. The current rule is if you have deferred taxes, you characterize them as current or non-current depending on the underlying thing that the deferred relates to. Okay? So if it's depreciation is your deferred, depreciation relates to fixed assets. Fixed assets on the balance sheet are a non-current asset. So that means the deferred related to that is a non-current deferred. If the deferred relates to bad debt reserve, bad debts relate to receivables. Receivables are current assets. So the DTA for bad debt reserve is a current asset. The rule is you do all that current, non-current stuff for every single one of your deferreds. And to the extent that you have a deferred that doesn't relate to a thing, right, like an NOL. An NOL doesn't relate to a, pre, uh, a balance sheet item. And so with those sorts of things, you're supposed to just estimate when they will turn. Okay, am I going to use my NOL next year or in 10 years? If next year, it's current. If it's in 10 years, it's non-current. So you were supposed to go through every one of your deferreds and make a conclusion. Is this a current or non-current <coughs> deferred? You sum up all the currents, and if it's an asset, you book a current asset. If it's a liability, you book a liability, but you only book one current balance. And then you do the same thing with non-currents. You add them all up, and if it's a non-current net asset, you book a non-current asset. If it's a net liability, it's a liability. But you'll see you have two answers. Right, you book deferreds in two places. Like you could have a current asset and a non-current asset. You could have a current asset and a non-current liability. You could have any combination of those four things. If all you had was, say, like current items, well, then you would just have one balance. But if you had current and non-current things, deferreds, you would have at least two balances. That rule works by jurisdiction, just like every provision rule. So that means in every jurisdiction, you would do that same netting. And because in every jurisdiction you could get different results, you could be a company that ends up with all four types of deferreds on your balance sheet once you finally get around to enough jurisdictions. Okay. Separate tax paying jurisdictions. So, yeah. People don't do it with states. Usually states get netted as one. But, yeah, Missouri is very different from California. Right? You net them because of you're being practical, not because there's any like actual rationale to that. Okay, the the proposal is to stop doing that, and just to look at um, all your deferreds as non-current instead of this current versus non-current thing. And when the FASB said, "Hey, would that make your life simpler?" Everyone's like, "Oh yeah, do that." And nobody cares about current or non-current deferreds. People don't understand these deferreds anyways, right? Like you, know you guys are having a hard time understanding the deferreds. And you're here to understand the deferreds. So, in, once the rules go final, all deferreds will be non-current. It won't be like this smattering of balances. You could expect to see it in one place on the balance sheet. But as of now, that's how the rules work. Does that, does that click? Okay. Um. You know, all these things that you see in the disclosures, right? Like, 
you see companies describe their carry forwards. You see them do a rate rec. You see them explain what their undistributed earnings are. It's all because there are, there are requirements in the literature that require them to say these things. Okay? So when you see commonality between disclosures, every company has a disclosure checklist that they use. And that disclosure checklist just follows the um, FASB and SEC guidance in terms of what's required. And companies make sure they say all those things. And so disclosures are very complete, and they're not like casually put together. Um, and again, you see the commonality because it's not up to a company in a lot of cases what they say. There are just a lot of requirements in terms of what's included. Okay. All these FIN 48, these, these disclosures around your reserves, like that, ta that roll forward you see of the exposures and how every year you see how it you begin a year with exposures and you end a year with a different balance and there's that roll forward, you have to do that. Um, you have to disclose how much interest and penalties you've accrued. You're supposed to say what you forecast the activity is going to be. Like All these things you have to say. Okay? So like I said, every company when they're putting their 10K and 10Qs together, they'll have a checklist and they'll be like, did I do this? Did I do that? Did I do this? And they'll go through it carefully. Um, it's a very like rigorous process. Okay, so in theory, I would have you prepare all the disclosures for that in-class exercise we did. If we had enough time, we would do that. Um, I'm not going to do that. So, all right, we've, we're through 10 steps. Okay? All right, so practice, right? We're going to keep giving you homework. The homework's going to have problems. I know it's hard, but the only way it'll be better is if you practice. That is all there is to it. If you guys want to get together in groups and practice, that's great. Right? Try to do it independently. Compare your answers. See where you get to. Right? If you get different answers, figure out which one to use right. You might like meet and just have one problem and take two hours, but like that's time well spent. I mean, that's the way you're going to learn this stuff. For um, the next class. So, your homework. You have reading. This one, man, if you don't do the reading and you just listen to me in class, you're going to be super confused. If you do the reading and you come to class and listen to me, you'll still be confused, but less so. So, I'm telling you, this one, definitely try. Try to do the reading. Okay? Try to understand it. And then as I'm talking in class, try to like, sit back and reflect. Okay, I read that. What does that mean? Like, How did that work? I would recommend reading our um, roadmap book. Uh, I think this is going to help you the most. So read that. When I was like your age, I had a master's professor. My master's was at a different school. I was at USC, and um, it was pretty uh, unmemorable. But um, <laughs> there was one teacher I had, and he used to say his like coin phrase was. Read with the precision of a laser, but the speed of a glacier. <laughs> that was his like off kind of rhyme, but not really rhyme. And like that's how you should read that that um, roadmap stuff. So read slow, read careful, and then if you want, read it again. Right? It makes more sense the second time. Okay. So read uh, Facebook's 10K and think stock comp. They have a lot of stock comp issues. In fact, they have some spectacular stock comp issues. Um, a lot of people have gotten very wealthy off Facebook stock, right? And that is going to be reflected in the accounting. So you should be able to see in their effective tax rate and in other aspects of their provision um, the impact of stock comp in a huge way. It's not subtle. So I want you to think about them and Stockcom, because well, I'll tell Chris when um, he comes that Stockcom is the thing we're covering. So as we talk about his 10K disclosure, we should talk about Stockcom. Okay. Um, and I'll give you a hint. In during the year, they acquired um, a company by the name of WhatsApp, and they paid a lot of money for it, right, like 20 billion dollars. 
And a lot of that purchase price was stock compensation. It was paying out some of the target shareholders that had stock compensation. And the effects of paying that out, you can see in, in certain ways in their provision, in addition to kind of normal Facebook compensation. So look for that. Like, how does it affect the rate? Can I see how it affects cash taxes? Um, like, where in the disclosures can I see any disclosure about this? Like, what can I learn from public information? Okay. Some of that information is super sensitive. He's not going to tell you it's not public. But you can see what, you know, you can see from the 10 Um And then the last bit of your homework is, unlike our problems, I also want you to um, use words and write a one-page explanation of three stock comp related items that can impact an effective tax rate. So on one piece of paper that has three paragraphs, after you've done the reading, explain three scenarios where stock compensation can impact your effective rate. There are many more than three. So three is very doable. 